Welcome to the Growler, a Who Day podcast hosted by Paul Dana and other bald friends like Mo Egger, Dave Nanamis, home of all your Bengals breaks, takes. Welcome to the Growler. All right. Welcome into the latest edition of Balds Don't Lie. Paul Dana Jr. here with you on Tuesday with my good friend Jay Morrison. What's up, Jay? Hey, doing good. Um, it's, hard, it's another one of those weeks where you got to figure out what day it actually is because the schedule's all jacked up. But um, I'm here with you, so I know it's Tuesday. You know it's Tuesday. We're going to do it, and we will be joined by our good friend and uh, third member of the three best friends anyone can have, Mo Egger, uh, who will come in. And we, we've we just we just got a lot. We got a lot. There's a lot <laughs> going on. There's a lot to dissect um, this current point in time would be i believe what's dubbed sports radio gold is what we would call this uh uh, mo has had no shortage of topics to fill the airwaves and that's one of those where you look down at the phones and they're just all lit up everybody (laughs) has opinions and thoughts and they're ready to get them off their chest so we have a plenty of discussion we're going to get into there with mo we're going to play a little game with mo of of trying to figure out who you're building around what do you what do you what are you building around right now and so we'll get into that and, and many other things in the fallout from this past weekend and, and where this team is at in the season um we've got that all our segments of course jay's got stats growler bet arby's you know how we do it our, our main topic today is going to be about luana rumo uh, kind of continuing down this line. We spoke with him on Monday. You're going to hear about seven minutes of that conversation. It was very interesting. Um, and you can judge from things that he was saying and his tone about where things stand with him on the defense side of the ball. Also, you'll hear from Zach Taylor, um, who had some very interesting things to say about where things stand with this defense, his responsibility in this defense, and many other things. Um, all right reminder uh our next live show is before the browns game uh which is now on the 22nd uh you come on down there to bet mgm nation kitchen and bar at the banks great place to catch any big event but certainly a great place to come before a Bengals game and we will be down there doing our thing giveaways you know how we do it Uh, a great time down there always uh you can go down there for any ufc event they're getting big crowds down there no covers great time that down there for all of those nation kitchen and bar.com you can go on there to reserve a table for anything you want to at any point great food great deals on drinks everything you could possibly want um all right jay let's run down some of the news shall we yeah let's do it uh all right cody ford we didn't really get a chance to we, with all that was going on we didn't really get a chance to talk much about the move from cody ford and away from Cordell Volson uh, sounds like that move is going to stick at least for now, man, a, a certainly a brutal blow for Cordell Volson and a guy that you thought was going to be a piece that you were going to be building around a little bit on this offensive line going forward, at least before the season started, there was that hope there was that trajectory. And now you have uh, Cody Ford taking his place and certainly stunting any momentum or, or hope that you had that, that was going to continue to be part of the answer yeah and i mean cody didn't even really play that well and to still come out and say that's that's the plan moving forward i I think that speaks volumes about cordell and i i I assume you know you keep him around he's a depth piece and but uh, again it's another draft pick and it's not one of these high ones that have not panned out a little bit of a flyer when you take a guy in the fourth round but when he comes in and starts right away you would expect much more in year three than they've gotten from him. And so it's another player that they have failed to develop and in showing regression. And it's just part of the theme of why this season is where it is. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that was the one that Frank Pollock kind of had felt like maybe he was going to have in his cap, you know, Mm -hmm. it was okay. You know, I know it's been bad here and, and that they haven't been able to draft and develop and, and what have you, but you know, Cordell was coming along. It felt like maybe they found something in a fourth round guy. And then, Hey, and Amarius Mims is playing really well. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to be kind of a project. He's doing really well. You know, it felt in this sort of, it just, 
this season, really, not this decision. I think this decision is just emblematic of this season. It's just another one of those that makes you continue to question this offensive line pro- process from, from soup to yeah. nuts, from from who they pick, why they pick them, how they develop them, who's developing them, all of that stuff. Um, do, do, you know, I, I want to spend more time in later weeks here talking more about Amarius Mims. He has really been a success story. <laughs> We're not talking mm-hmm. about him, which goes to show how much of a success story he has been, uh, but continues to play really good football over there. Right tackle. One of the few things that you're not worried about um, right now. Things you are worried about, Jay. Geno Stone. Jeez. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who just played a, a, just an awful game against the Steelers. Lou Anarumo pretty adamant with us that Geno Stone is still all in. He's all in on tackling. He's into these games, and he's sticking behind him, and he's going to continue to be the guy. Surpri- surprised by – maybe we shouldn't be surprised by that at this point. Um, the fact that we're sitting here saying, like, can Tyson Anderson and Dejon Anthony do this is probably tells you how poorly Geno Stone has played considering, you know, the acquisition that he was this offseason. Yeah, and it, it, I mean, it kind of goes with the theme of of what we're going to get into with Lou here in a little bit. But I don't think, I don't think Lou's in position to. I I don't think that would sit well with the front office who they paid all this money to, and they have eyes. They see that he has that Geno hasn't played well, but to to bench him in favor of one of these guys. But Tyson Anderson still has one career defensive snap, so that's an issue there. DJ Ivy potentially sliding in there. He's seventh round pick from last year i just to to go that route and and blow that up i don't think that that would that would go over well and you just gino has does has played a lot in this league even though he hasn't played well i I just think that they it's a it's a classic case of lesser of two evils by sticking with it sure i mean you could go battle bell but those two don't necessarily Mm -hmm. really fit next to each other back there but yeah it does sound like geno stone they're going to be sticking with him for now now sticking with him for the long term uh i don't think you could make any kind of assumptions with that we'll get into that more a little bit with mo Mm -hmm. um pro bowl voting is out here we go let's go right let's let's turn (laughs) turn that brown upside down bangle fan here we go pro bowl voting what do you what, what, what happened in pro bowl voting jay uh, I think the most surprising thing, and maybe not surprising based on the season he's having, but just based on name recognition and past Pro Bowl, Trey Hendrickson is leading all defensive ends, includes Miles Mur- uh, Miles Murphy, of course, definitely, Miles Murphy. definitely uh, includes Miles. Murphy. He, he's ahead of Miles Garrett. He's he's Miles Garrett's in second. T.J. Watt they list as an outside linebacker, so he's he's leading that category. But I thought that was a little surprising that that um, Trey Hendrickson was above Miles Garrett there, probably a. Part of that is Cleveland right there with the Bengals and having a really disappointing season. Um, Jamar Chase leads the AFC. He's second among wide receivers. Justin Jefferson leads the the way there. And then Joe Burrow, third among quarterbacks behind Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson. So um, those are the only guys in the top 10 anywhere. You have three former Bengals in the top 10. Kevin Zeitler, year 13, leading all guards in voting. It's, it's remarkable. And he, it's not like he's been a perennial pro bowler either. He last year was the first year he went to the pro bowl. Uh, and then Joe Mixon sixth among running backs. And now the other one is escaping me. The, Oh, Jesse Bates, of course. Fifth yeah. Among safeties. Oh, yeah. Still no respect for Jesse. Um, considering how well he has played. Um, all right. Uh, let's go. No Emmanuel Forbes. So Emmanuel Forbes yeah. was a, was a topic when he got let go by the commanders. I mean, he's been terrible there. Just awful benched worked his way down to the point that a guy who was just a couple years, I mean, we're not that far removed from the Emmanuel Forbes conversation. He was somebody the Bengals had their eye on. He was a first round pick, a top 20 pick and just let go uh, in year two, right for him. And yeah. so you're talking about 18 months removed from being a top 20 pick. The team takes on the dead cap money and says, just get the hell out of here. Now, not a great sign for him or his career or or what you would think about him, but the Bengals are in a position, certainly, they're looking for answers anywhere. That includes change of scenery candidates that are maybe long-haul long type guys. Um, and they could have put in a claim and taken them, and they opted not to do so. The Rams end up putting in the claim and getting Emmanuel Forbes and seeing if they can find a way to get out of a guy who showed a lot of talent and promise coming out of the draft. Surprising, you know, I'm not going to boycott you know, someone's like, oh, you know, are you surprised by that? How close they are to all-out boycott, they wouldn't do that. This isn't this is an all-out boycott situation, okay? I mean, this is a 
I would have done it. I, I, I would have, and I would have stashed him. And I would say, let's go with an off season of work and and see what you got. There's no, there's no need to have any connection to him. You could cut him next off season, in the off season or in camp or whenever. All the same, but a, a guy with talent that you could just snag and put in your system and see what happens down the line would certainly make sense considering where they're at at a position of need. They didn't, um, you know, whatever. I mean, he, he can't tackle. He's been awful in coverage. Maybe you're just saying it's not there, but a little surprising, but I don't think it's egregious necessarily. Yeah. And, and, and maybe they're still burned by the John Ross thing or that, that was the knock on Forbes coming out is his size. He was, he too slight to play in this league. Mm-hmm. And then after a year and, and six games this year, maybe that when that's proven to be true, then you say, okay, then the the negative outweighs any positive. I mean, he is a credible athlete. He was taking one pick ahead of Christian Gonzalez, who's playing fantastic. So mm-hmm. it, he was a first-round pick for a reason. It wasn't like the commanders reached out of the blue and, and grabbed this guy and ever, stunned everybody by making him a first pick. I think if they hadn't taken him, somebody was going to take him in the first round. So you you think there's enough there to, to take a shot on him. And, and I go back to uh, last week, asked Zach about, Charles Harris, why they didn't put a claim in for him, the defensive end. Um, and, and he said, you know, we we played against him. We saw what he is. And well, they didn't play against Forbes. Forbes was inactive for that game against Cincinnati in week three this year. But but still, I just think that there's enough there where what, when you've got a knock on a guy and it plays out to be true after 23 games, then, then maybe you say, okay, we that that part of it is is correct don't need to take the risk, but it's not a big risk. I, I, I'm kind of with you there. I don't I don't know why you wouldn't bring him in and see what you can develop, but he's still on a rookie deal. It's not going to be a, a big cost to you. Yeah, uh, taking him over Christian Gonzalez, not quite as egregious as taking John Ross over Patrick Mahomes, but <laughs> yes. neither here nor there. Speaking of mistakes, let's get into our, our main topic of the day, and that is we spoke with Luana Rumo at length yesterday. Obviously, embattled his unit struggling mightily to say the least um and a, a lot of people he's never been under this kind of level of scrutiny and pressure as he has been as this season has gone along and never more than this moment um as people figure out what's going to happen going forward and and certainly his name is at the top of of the list right now of most likely people that are going to be taking the fall for this season and understandably so when you consider how it has gone i want to just before we bring in mo and get to all of that i want to just open with Luana Rumo and specifically listen to how he opened. When he sits down with reporters, he's down in the media room. This It's typically a sit down and it opens with fire away guys where you got and we kind of go into whatever questions. He opened with a statement uh, in this and that's where this will start and then the rest of it you'll hear the question and answer with our with our small group uh and, and so just take a listen to that and i think the themes that develop in it are interesting and we'll start breaking all that down uh and, and bring in mo Egger when we when we come back from that so here is uh about seven minutes of our conversation with luana rumo from monday inside the Bengals media room you know obviously uh all of this starts and ends with me um you know how how we uh how we play is, is certainly my responsibility. I think the players have done a fantastic job of preparing, uh, practicing with energy, giving us their best. Um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the way we've gone about that. Um, we need to do a better job. I need to do a better job of making sure it shows up on Sundays. You know, this probably doesn't have an answer, but how does that carry carry over to games or not carry over to games? Yeah, I mean, it just comes down to the. It always comes down to the little things, you know. And I and I've said it for unfortunately for the last few weeks is just the inconsistencies, um, and and that's something that you know we're harping on and. Uh, but um, we'll continue to fight to get better every day and find answers for things that have been hurting us. Jordan just said that when we asked him about Jordan, the battle. battle. Yeah, sorry. Um, we asked him about the fields play and attend the game, mm-hmm. and he said, you know, we didn't read our keys. Like, we knew that this was coming, and yeah. they still didn't execute. Zach kind of just said that, like, the details were off yesterday. Mm-hmm. What? How do you fix that? Because... You know, you're supplying them with the information that they need. They know it's coming, yeah. and it still isn't executed. Like, how do you how do you fix that? Well, we just keep. It's like anything else. We just keep drilling down on the small little details of knowing that when Justin Fields, come, you know, comes in the game, he's likely to keep the ball on the perimeter. You know, we, we 
they know that. And uh, but it doesn't matter what they know; they have to do it. They have to execute it on Sundays. And and you know, we just we we uh, myself starts with me as I mentioned ten times already um, that we got to make sure we get it done. I think it's the most you've ever said. You know. It's- Taking the blame for kind of how well, things are Well, that's part of my job. I mean, for sure. But do you, is there maybe more you've been, I mean, you've been through this thing from the beginning. Is this maybe the most pressure you felt personally since you've been here? How would you? How would I you mean, I, there's as much pressure um, in this league. Every day you walk into the building, you know, my focus is on our players and trying to get them better every day. That's all I think about. I mean, we all know as NFL coaches what we signed up for. Um, and like I said, uh, uh, you know, uh, my concerns are our players and getting them in the best position to be successful on Sundays. That's all I think about. How how does your process maybe change over the course of the season as you guys, you and Zach, have worked together to try to get the fixes? Mm-hmm. Has your has he been? You guys been in more, you know, working differently in terms of the schedule or meetings or ways you guys talk about things defensively? Well, Zach and I, Zach and I go through a lot. Uh, you know, usually, you know, at night when he's um, done with his portion of it I'm done with my portion of it and uh, we get together and talk through things and that hasn't changed um, you know since year one you know and we have a good process and he tells me what he sees and you know vice versa and um, you know I certainly welcome the input there as, he, as an offensive play caller and as he sees things and um, you know we uh, we go through the game at post post game too and making sure that hey here's what they were trying to do and I can see what happened here and um, so, you know, we keep that communication open all the time. I think it's uh, invaluable to, to do that. You guys have been through a ton here together. What, what, what is, is this as frustrating as a season as you guys have gone through, as you guys try to work through all of it, feeling like there's so much good happening, but you keep ending up in these yeah. types of spots? Yeah, I think, you know, obviously I wouldn't be human if I didn't say I wasn't frustrated yeah. with the outcomes. You know, we all, we all do um, – as much as humanly possible to get and play up to our standard, um, and, and that's something that you know we, I pride myself on, and the, and the rest of the coaches, um, and we'll just we'll keep doing that every day. So, what was your message? Your message? Uh, my message was, um, you know, we've got great men. We we signed up to, uh, for an NFL uh, players and coaches, and, and our jobs are to come out and practice like professionals and meet like professionals and play like professionals. And um, that means, what does that mean? It means having great energy, having great passion for the game and, you know, play these five games and see where we're at at the end of it, you know. And I think that that's what the task at hand is. And I'd be disappointed if if we didn't approach it that way. I think that we have the right kind of guys that will do that, the right kind of leadership. And, um, you know, I, I'm confident that they will. Do you, do you, do you rip it up? I mean, you know, do, you have, do you have thoughts about ripping it up? And maybe ripping the, what up? Just the, not the scheme, but just maybe ripping up, uh, maybe striving anew or something. I don't know. Really. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's, a, there's certainly multiple approaches to things. Um, I think, um, you know, we, we uh, will do what we think our guys can do best and, and take from that and move forward. How tough was that conversation with Vaughn when you said, hey, we're going to end up making a change and, and switch here, given the relationship, given yeah. you know, how long y'all know each other? Where would you rate that conversation? I mean, it, you know, I've had to do it before with other players. Um, you know, he's a, a very prideful human, um, and that's part of the reason why he's been who he is over the years. Um, so, you know, uh, I'll keep what we said to each other to ourselves, but, uh, you know, he came in in the place he had. He, he played really well. Is that would you? I mean, you've you've, you've had a lot of beloved guys over the course of your career in New York, Miami. Yeah. Where do you feel like that was probably one of the toughest conversations you've had to have? With well, it certainly players? wasn't easy. You know, he's he helped us build this thing. You know, and you know, and when you are going through that with somebody, you know, and he's probably had you t- you guys tell me one of the bigger plays in Bengal history on on the Jesse Tip to him in the championship game. So, um, and you know, he's had a lot more than that. But um, I feel like his hit on Juju back in 20 started the whole thing, to be quite honest with you. Um, so, but, um, so, yeah, it wasn't easy. Do you feel like your, your message is still connecting with people or when you say, i got to do better, is that what you're referring to about finding better ways for your message to get across? No, to my message is getting across crystal clear. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I, I know what it feels like when players, uh, I think we all do as coaches at some point, feel like if, if maybe it's not. Um, but it's no different than being a teacher and you're in your classroom and if all eyes aren't on you, you got an issue. All eyes are always on me. Um, and uh, they, I have a great respect for, the, for all of the players in our room. And um, I know that uh, I, I feel like they'll, they'll give us our best. And you know, I feel like my message is getting across to answer your question. All right. There is uh, Lou Ann Arumo. Uh, and we kind of hear a little bit of everything from him right we we, mm-hmm. we we touch on a bunch of different things um on that note uh, i do want to bring in our good friend and yours uh mo egger to uh to join the program mo how we doing bud what's going on uh not, just listening to lou and arumo yeah <laughs> well, or your uh w- w- do you did you have any quick feelings or takeaways on that i don't have any really I don't have any real takeaways. I I hate that this is how it's ending for him. Yeah. You know, this is, we talked about this, I think two weeks ago when I was in the uh, parking lot at graders. Um, I, I, I hate, I, I, I I hate that we've gone from Lou being a beloved Bengals figure that we were all rooting for to be a head coach to now. I, I hate to say he's public enemy. Number one. But now everybody wants him gone, and perhaps very justifiably so. And he's kind of become the avatar for why this season has gone the way it has. I I hate that. And so, um, you guys could tell me is is he required to do that? Like the head coach has a press conference every week. Was he required to do that yesterday? No, he's not required. But it's been pretty standard. Right. They'll have a, the coordinators will talk each week. Yeah, there's so, been the kind of rotation either him or or Dan Pitcher on Monday after games is is has done that all season. One of them has been in there usually by request of us. So maybe I'm giving him credit he doesn't deserve, and and maybe I'm just I don't know. I have a soft spot in my heart today for some reason. His defense was embarrassed, and he talked to you guys. And yeah. I'm gonna guess there are people in his capacity that the next day would have said, "F it, I ain't doing it." So. I, I, my first takeaway listening to him was, I think it's cool that he did that. Yeah. I think yeah. it's cool that he did that. And I, I, I think his tone, like, nothing he's going to say is going to make anybody feel better, right? No, there's nothing that he could say that's going to make anybody feel better about how the defense has played this season or what should happen with his job at the end of the year. But the mere fact that he did it, I, I think that's cool. And I, I hate that this is, I hate that this is how it's ending for him. I hate that this is how it's ending for a lot of those guys, right? Like, you know, he was talking about Von Bell. Man, Von Bell is a key figure in this franchise's history. And to have it, and this is how it works, I get it, but to to have it sort of peter out the way it has for him and for a a bunch of other guys as a fan is, is really sad. Um, And, and so I, I hate that he's like the guy and, he deserves it and he acknowledged that and the defense deserves it. And, you know, the way they played on, on Sunday, you know, we we talked about this on our show yesterday, the the Justin Fields run at the end of the game. (laughs) Yep. You know, (laughs) how do you look so blatantly unprepared? But I, but I, I hate that this is what we're doing with five games to go, man. Yeah. That's just it. I mean, it's sort of, there's, there's, different emotions that I think fans are going through and you go from like disbelief to anger and and now, but I I think there is, you know, these end of these seasons, as many as I've covered and certainly many of them have felt like this in December. uh, There's a level of just sadness. You hate to see this for these people. And that's, and this is people that have brought so much joy to this city. You know what I mean? That we're part of one of the greatest moments in franchise history. And I'm by moments, I mean a, two and a half year span really uh of some of the best football that the franchise has ever seen um and so yeah there's no doubt about that what i what i want to start is what the few through the like big picture view the long view i I, there's a ton that happened in the game on on a micro level that we could get into and and (laughs) we have in different outlets what was the most appalling thing in terms of the big picture view of the franchise's future from Sunday 
that stood out to you afterwards when you start thinking about like, man, where does it go from here? I think just watching the performance of the defense against an offense that's not great. Yeah. Coming off of a bye and you're watching the game unfold. At least I was. And you're going, boy, I don't want that guy to be here next year. Boy, boy, <laughs> boy that that area right there, they need an overhaul. Like, that's kind of how I watched the game on Sunday was through that lens of, all right, we can stop kidding ourselves. This team's not good enough. Even if they win the game, right? This this team is not good enough for them to accomplish what people like me want them to accomplish. They're, they're, we can stop. I mean, that to me is, you talk about an overarching theme. I, I came home and said to my wife, like, well, we can stop lying to ourselves. Like, I, I don't, we don't, we don't have to do the, oh, is this one a must win? And hey, let's, let's do playoff math. Like they're, they're not good enough. And this crystallized it. But beyond that, I watched the, the game through the lens of who, who can they build around? And Paul, this is something you and I have talked about. Like who, who on this defense am I dying to see play for the Bengals next season? And the answer is nobody. Yeah. Now that's I, just it. I know there are going to be players from this year's team who are on next year's team, but that's as the game unfolded, um, as I was, as my toes were freezing, the guy that I was at the game with, I, I, I kept saying like, you know, Chris Jenkins came off, right? Came, came off. They looked at him on the field and I said like, well, there's, there's a guy that I like to keep. Like I, cause we were kind of doing this as the game is unfolding. Like, you know, those linebackers, do we want them? And, you know, I know Cam Taylor Britt had a pick six, which was really cool, but we're, we're kind of, you know, clicking through the names as the game is going on. And then Chris Jenkins was taken off the field momentarily. And I'm like, well, actually, I, I think that guy, I want to see more of him. Okay. Well, there weren't many of those. No. So that's, if this makes sense, that's kind of the, the filter that I was using on Sunday was just watching that defense just implode. Poor tackles. You know, there was a play in the game in the third quarter where it was second and 11. And, I, you know, I, I asked the great Jim Kelly on UC broadcast years ago. I'm like, you know, give me give me a hint or two as to like, how do I watch the game like an analyst? And he's like, on defense, look for the grass. And there is this just enormous, like it was the side of my backyard, <laughs> swath of grass. And Jack Skoranek literally runs to it, turns around, catches it breaks a tackle, gains 23 yards. And I'm like, before the play, I'm like, I know where the ball's going. I know where the ball's going. So there were so many moments like that. You know, Pittsburgh is running Cordero Patterson out of the backfield, and he's just like leaking through and turning around and catching the pass. And the Bengals had no answer for it. No. No answer for it whatsoever. And like, there's a, I think there's a difference between a, a, a defense that gets worked and a defense that shows no resistance. Like sometimes good defense gets beat, right? It's the NFL. Those, mm -hmm. those dudes on offense sometimes they make plays. Sometimes your 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 um your pass rush your pass rush blitz works, and the quarterback just gets out of trouble. We see it with Joe Burrow all the time, and he makes a play. Or sometimes the coverage is perfect, and the guy just makes a play. Or sometimes there's great coverage, and the quarterback gets out of trouble, and a dude just gets open, and like, hey man, our defense was good. They just made a play, but there's resistance there. There was no resistance at all. None. Um, and and I, I know I'm sort of rambling here, but but that was that. And then, you know, the, the, the final sort of encapsulation of Justin Fields comes on the field and everybody in the stadium is very well aware of what the Steelers are about to do. And the Bengals were helpless against it. Helpless. <laughs> Unbelievable. There's no question. I, I was going to say, I, I think the Justin Fields play is the first line of defense for Lou because, you know, Skinny alludes to it in that question. Obviously, they repped that play. Obviously, they worked and told them when he comes in, that's what's going to happen. And for the players to still fight the way they did and go down, and maybe it goes to your question, Paul, about the message just doesn't get through. But I, I'm i I'm with you, Mo. It, you, you look and you see who, who are they going to build around and – the, so much angst about the guys they let walk, the guys they didn't pay, Jesse Bays, DJ Reader. And then you start thinking about the ones they did. And Geno Stone, they paid him. A big reason for Sunday's loss or performance. You know, Jermaine Pratt, 
paid him. They're, they're, they're paying the wrong guys. They're letting other Sheldon guys Rankins. walk. In. Sheldon Rankins has not given them anything all year. <laughs> I just want to make sure you didn't get left off that list. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. That's a, <laughs> but that's it. And, so, and I'm with you. you I, I think that's where it starts is Jenkins and, and even McKinley Jackson. That They are rookies, and they 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 look like there's there's potential there. And, and you got three more years to kind of see if they are building blocks. I, I'm wondering, Mo, you know, you, you go to all these games. You talked about your toes are cold. You're disgusted by what you see on the on the field. <laughs> is there anything that could happen against Cleveland where you would just say, nope, I'm not even going to the Denver game. Um, well, I'm not going to the Browns game because we have a two o'clock oh. UC basketball game, so oh, I will okay. miss the Battle of Ohio. <laughs> oh. This is going to sound stupid. I just like going. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I just, I just like going. I like going to the games. So now, with nothing to play for, will I see if there's other things happening that I could be a part of? <laughs> sure, but I, I, I like. I like going to the games and, and I, I, it's more fun when they're good. It's more fun when the games have consequence, but I like, I, I, there's still this, this sounds so stupid. There's still that like 11 year old in me that on Sunday morning, I, I knew it was going to be cold. I know this team is going nowhere. I was excited to go to the football game. Like yeah. I just, I still like, and I, and there will be, there will be folks who hear that and say, well, I'm the problem, right? I'm, I'm, the, I'm the problem. Well, maybe, but I, I get a kick out of going to Bengals games. I get a kick out of going to sporting events. And so now if it's sub Arctic and the game doesn't matter, <laughs> uh, I don't know. But if, if it's, if it's like it was on Sunday, I, I will, I will probably, I will probably be there. Well, listen, I I've, I've heard you brag about the litmus test games over the years and where, yes. you know, were you there, right? Wasn't it, isn't it the, the Jacksonville game in the snow? Is that still the current record holder for a uh, lowest moment? Wasn't I, that? I, 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 well, there are a few that come to mind. There's the Jacksonville game, the only game I've ever gone to by myself, 2000. Christmas, yeah. In the snow. Christmas Eve, Detroit. Christmas Eve, Detroit, 2017. Yeah. Yeah. And then the game after the Bengals clinched the number one overall pick in 2019, the, the Browns game where they got just shellacked. Now, I'll be honest, I left that game at halftime. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I was home by the uh, start of the fourth quarter. There are those litmus test games. And, uh, but, but like, I'm watching Monday Night Football last night, and I'm like, well, it might be kind of fun to watch Bo Nix throw for 7,000 yards against that um, secondary. Here's my question, okay? There are five games to go. Um, there's a very good chance that three of those are played with the Bengals mathematically eliminated. The tragic number is two. Mm -hmm. Denver doesn't play this coming week. And so, but there's that's a, a sizable chunk of the season. When did the business decision start? And what do they do with Joe Burrow in those final few games, understanding that putting him at risk of more hits against teams that I'm sure will be happy to tee off on him probably doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's it's not just week 18. A lot of, a lot of teams bench their quarterback for week 18. We're talking about the possibility of a rather large swath of games where you can run your quarterback out there. Zach doesn't like to play Joe in games that don't matter in August. Is he going to play him in games that don't matter in November? <laughs> Well, the contention would be, do they do they matter? Because Joe Burrow doesn't like to come out of anything, uh, and he feels like that's part. You know, right? Aren't we learning about how the cornerstones of the uh, organization react will set the the you know the tone going forward? I was told, and that's if, if that's part of it. You know, I go back to last year. Sam Hubbard had every reason imaginable not to play in that last game of the season. Mm -hmm. Every reason, including surgeries, playing through pain. The game meant nothing. Uh, it was all backups for both sides. He wanted to be out there. I'm out there with my guys when I have to, when it's time to play a game. And that matters to me. I feel like that attitude with Burrow specifically um, will be a part of this trying to think about this is about not just this year or this game but about building things going forward and i think that's especially true when you start talking about home games uh those those will matter that joe burrow is playing and i think joe will want to chase some numbers yeah uh, too sure. Uh, sure. and that will be part of it but we have we have so much time <laughs> That's what to, to discuss about that this, part. Right? I know we have a whole we have five weeks. Like here, here, here is the one thing that I here is the one thing that I that I think is gonna be is an important one for this moment. And and you mentioned it earlier. 
And that is, you know, with, with the defensive side of the ball, though, you hear Lou's message and, and you, you hear him putting it on himself and you hear him saying that these guys still want it. They are into it. They're, we may not have much to play for, but they are into it. They're giving me everything. The, it's there in practice. They're practicing hard. It's just not translating to game day. They're not getting the, the small things. They're not tackling whatever. You, you can hear him saying, I am connected, connecting to these guys, and I am getting the most out of these guys. These guys aren't good. It feels like he's saying these guys aren't good. You know this what I mean? The, They're not good enough. I this am being what at, getting the most looks like. <laughs> I, I, you 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 heard it. I mean, yeah. it sounds like he's saying these guys are into it, and it is saying it's on me to get more out of them and connect with them. It it, it feels like you know if, if they're engaged all the way and they're into it. And, you know, your and your message is getting across and all that's the case. Then the only answer left to come from that is did, you were handed a pile of chicken shit. Right. I mean, and and so what am I wrong? Do you feel like that's am I am I misconstruing it, it, going too far in, in inferring of what he's saying? No, I, I think you clocked it. Um, I think the question now moving forward is. The person who gave him the pile of chicken shit is going to be in charge of the next iteration of the Bengals defense. Yeah. Yeah. How how am I supposed to feel about that? And again, this is a, a different set of circumstances than, you know, the last, if you want to call it, overhaul the Bengals defense in 2020 and 2021 because they could just throw money at it. And that's that's not how it's going to be done now. So, you know. What the Bengals try to do with this particular defense is on in some way, shape, or form, I guess, going to be what they try to do with what's next. Free agency will be a part of that, but not the overpays, not not the spending like a drunken sailor. And they're going to have to nail it in the draft, and they're going to have to to nail it in the draft on defense while also addressing positions of need on offense. And so, like, that's that's the question that I have. How does this get done in one offseason? Yeah. Okay, no, I don't. I mean, I don't know if you can. And that's it's, it's funny. You know, Mo, you did kind of ruin the game I wanted to play with oh, here when no. I was going to say, oh, no, I was going to oh. say is who do you build around? Like, like if we were going to do a draft here and and draft players on the defense that you're willing to build around and you're like, I'm not even turning in a pick. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I'm taking I'm going Viking style and I'm just passing on my pick. Right. I, I feel like is kind of. It, it, is I mean I would, where would you start? Where would you start? You know where would you Trey Hendrickson? But again, to me, and this is my sort of hot take, is I think you have to think long and hard about trading Trey Hendrickson. Yes, because he's the you need multiple things, yes. not one thing, and yeah. he's the one thing of value you have that can get you more things to use, and you need to you need money to spend in other places, whether it's multiple mid-level players just to get yourself to some type of sustainability, picks, all of those things. And he is getting older. He's going to be mad about his money again. He's going to want more of it, and he's going to feel like he can just – you don't need another one of those. They just need so much that it, the saddest part of it is you might have to get rid of the one thing you can count on. It's a, it's a great point, and I'm with you. Yeah. Hey Trey, you wanted to trade. Well, guess what, pal? <laughs> <laughs> Which, but but if if you're opposed to that, what else you got? Because I know there are going to be people who hear that and you know they love Trey Hendrickson, and how could you not? Like I I, I understand that, but okay, you don't want to trade him and get draft capital and free up some money, and you badly need both things. Okay, well then, what do you have? What's the alternative? And I don't know what that is. I, I don't know what that is, and so. We're going to ask, you know, again, the 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 chicken shit that was given to Lou Anarumo, uh, the, the same person who piled that together, the same front office that piled that together is going to be in charge of cleaning it up and giving the defensive coordinator, whoever it is, a better group of guys with the expectation I, 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 that that they do better in 2025, like. We could say, well, they can't do it in one offseason. 
Well, I'm going to guess number nine is not in for, hey, yeah, I'll wait till uh, 2026. Yeah, go ahead and do what you got to do this year. B- mm. Build your defense. I'll, I'll be over here putting 35 on people every week while uh, you figure it out and we'll gear up for 26. How about 27? Like, <laughs> they're, they're in a really tough spot right now, man. It's This is not a very enviable place to be. And if you, I, 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 I'm not totally versed in this. I, you're saving 15.8 million if you trade Trey. I think you still have to eat the dead cap, even if it's trade. But it, his dead cap would only be two, so that's yeah, it's minimal. It's nothing. Yeah, so you, that's a that's an extra 13 and a half million to go get maybe a couple edge rushers. And but again, it's there's like a lot of guys like that. They can get out of Geno Stone's contract. For, oh, they have for tons very, of money. That very, they can, I mean, they have a lot yes. of dead weight that can clear them money to go. But again, it's they've got to go. You can't go still do the bodies. same thing you did last yeah. year. You when you spent on the wrong guys, you still have to get the right guys, and they've done it before. So I, I'm I'm not going to say it's impossible, um, but there's less room for error, and you know you you have the failure that's happened. It's just. It's it's an absolute mess. If you're talking about who you're building or who's that even starting, you know that's that's currently st- Logan Wilson is probably still going to be here. Okay. Dax Hill coming yeah. off an injury uh-huh. uh, is your starter in some capacity. I'm not giving up on Cam yet. Uh, I think Cam ends up in a battle for the last cornerback job of some sort. I think they probably have. There's going to be a pick and probably a player. You got to think. I mean, this is. I mean, this is like. We don't have this kind of time to go all the way down this road. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> I mean, it's – again, but where where are you going? Like, where where are you where are you building around guys that you can definitely count on? I mean, is Jordan Battle definitely your solution? I think we'll learn about him over the next five weeks. I, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. I just watched him be a part of the field to play. Um, you know, I, I – <laughs> it's just really hard – you know, Rankins, BJ Hill's a free agent. Hubbard, you gotta think that this is the end there. Um the 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 picks, all the picks behind them have yet to really show you anything. I, <laughs> you know, you're just having a hard time finding anybody. You're right. It's it's easy to play that game and be like, I, I don't see it. I don't know. Well, don't, what is what is the end. what's the exercise? Will you uh send out the Excel spreadsheet? We all have to pretend we're the general. Choose your own player. adventure. Yeah. Yeah. That's don't worry, be, that'd be fun. That'd be fun this off season. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna be deleting a lot of people. Yeah, the dead oh. the dead the dead weight column is gonna need to be expanded. Oh, I'm gonna need yeah. a, I'm gonna need an extra couple of days to put that spreadsheet together. I think <laughs> funnier, <laughs> so. nice. but the good news is I might have a couple extra days of time, so it works itself out. <laughs> uh <laughs> Mo, uh you will be uh you'll be in Hamilton today. I will be. Uh, yeah. Bridgewater Falls, Hamilton. Yes. Yes, Jay's yeah. Jay's Hood. I'm sure he can give you lots of good advice on routes to take and not take through Hamilton on your way over to that. I kind of got stuck on my way home last time, so you know. Yeah. Jay will help you out. I'm positive of that. Mo, appreciate your time as always, and uh, we have so much time to go into all this stuff. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. I'm fired up. I'm I'm yes. really fired up to spend these last five weeks putting a bow on the season. That'd be all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Have a good one, buddy. See you guys. Right, much thanks to uh, Mo for joining us as always. Uh, and you can always catch me with him on Tuesdays at B dubs all around the greater Cincinnati area. Before we go, we got some more stuff with Lou. We want to talk about the Zach Taylor side of this. Uh, but before we do that, I want to talk to you guys about. Yes. Our great friends at future fans football. Uh, you guys know by now uh, how much I enjoy this product, uh, how much I've talked about it, and how helpful it was for me uh, in teaching my daughters, who are seven and five, how football works, and that they're, they're into it now. They have their favorite players. They watch the games. They're learning about the sadness level of Bengals fans a little <laughs> bit, but they still like it. They don't. They're they're not hurt yet, right? They they still like it. They still get enjoyment out of watching it. They're still doing the gritty and they're doing the scratchy bottom hop dance that you learn about when you learn about the touchdown dances portion uh, of the of the future fans experience. For those that don't know, though, it's sort of a memory that you can create with your kids. It's what you want, right? You want to, you want to watch football together and figure out how to do it. And that's a matter of them understanding how it works. And so you have these storybooks that you go through and you, they learn how it works through parallel learning and stuff like that. And it's just the best. It's, it's, 
so easy for them to pick up the hard parts of the game because like learning the game is just it's just hard it's hard to learn the game it's a more challenging game than some of the other ones feature fans makes it easy and all of a sudden your kids like watching the games with you it's designed for kids who are four to eight and uh to to spend time with the football fan in their life and remember it is only 49.99 and you can go to futurefans.com slash bangles you find it locally at king arthur's court it locally in oakley in my hood so mm-hmm. if you you're looking for a christmas gift there's someone you know that has kids this is a great thing to do help them learn about the game of football it's fun they do the unboxing it's it's a great thing and my kids loved it yours will too all right on that note, Jay, um, let's talk a little bit more on the Luana Rumo stuff. Any, any, anything, anything else beyond what we went into with Mo from what we heard from Lou yesterday that 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 stood out to you? Yeah, I just I think the whole thing, his point about reading between the lines is important because, like him starting that saying, "This is all on me." A coach mm-hmm. has to say that. Co- Lou has been very honest with us throughout this his time here and and he has called out players and he's told us stuff off the record and and he he does go there when need be but this is different because he knows where things stand he knows he's probably not coming back next year but there, there's a chance so but even even if he knew he wasn't coming back next year he's he's still going to want to coach in this league and that's just not somewhere you can go and say it's all on the players they gave me chicken shit, as you guys said. You can't come out and say that. Now, you can say it without saying it. Um, and, and some of the things he does, he, he mentioned, does kind of point to that. And, and that goes back to what I was talking about with Geno Stone, where benching him would basically be saying the front office screwed this signing up. And and so I I think it's commendable that that he is saying it's all on me. But on the other hand, it, it's some, you just have to do it. You can't come out. It's just not a good look to come out and say, you know, we're we're teaching them to do this stuff and they're just not doing it. And not just for this organization, but it would have legs where wherever he goes next after this, wherever he wants to coach, that would that is something that would follow him. So um again, I I think it's the right thing to do, but I also think it's the obvious thing to do. Yeah. And I think it's when it's like, oh, you, you know, you you gave me bad players, not bad players, it's there's a bunch of young players. There's a bunch of, mm-hmm. you know, mid to lower level free agents that you settled for, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's Geno Stone instead of Jesse Bates or it's Sheldon Rankins instead of somebody better or more fitting or two rookies that had to fill the place of DJ Reader in part, you know, like they, it was just the the level cheaper every time. It was It, it was not adding veterans when you could have added veterans, whether it be at the deadline, whether it be in late in the, you know, in July or, or during August or whatever, not finding ways to add to the roster and, and it feeling like there's just not enough help that was there. I, I think that's, that's a big part of it is you just, the, the depth parts certainly showed up and lots of other things have gone wrong too. So it's like his feeling Obviously, feels like he's getting the most out of them, but it just feels like there's 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 not that much there right now. Maybe there will be down the line, especially with all of these young players. Again, I mean, so many rookies on this roster that they kept. I mean, and that's your margins. Those are the, those, and those are guys that you're you're counting on now. And you talk about the play against Fields, Josh Newton. Mm-hmm. I mean, this, he wasn't. He's a rookie, and he wasn't a fir- a day one or day two pick. You know, and you see mistakes like that. And that's like when you Dejon Anthony, when you had him out there against Kansas city, right? So many of the stakes Rico and the hold you were talking about this operation all year too. Like, the, and these are minor examples, but ones that have shown throughout the year, you've had so many rookies and young players or players that you cut corners on uh, that have been in these big spots and had to be counted on and haven't delivered. And it, all adds up and there's so much more than that and and so much is messed up it's hard to even focus on some of the minutiae but i think that's a big part of of where that conversation ends up landing yeah and the dajon thing is it's a good point but it's also that that one maybe is more on lou than than the front office where it, it was lou's decision to take mike hilton off the field on, on third downs and and go with these younger guys yeah. and and so that and and that was early in the season that's not a load management thing that's week two um so that that was a plan um I, I, 
how about a defensive coordinator run passer boot? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So, so what will happen next year? They will hire a young up and coming defensive coordinator. They will hire an experienced defensive coordinator, a la Robert Sala, or they run it back with Lou. Okay. Um, I, I am going to run with experienced mm. coordinator. I feel like you need that with the, the nature of how they kind of take care of everything. Uh, the, the nature of how the defense is in your hands. I think that what they need there, you need somebody, I think, who feels like they're running their own team. And I think they can get that by nature of the fact that they have Joe Burrow, if that's where mm -hmm. this ends up going. I, I think that is a drawing piece. I mean, be Joe, be the Spags uh, to Joe Burrow, like Spags is to Patrick Mahomes. I mean, that's the type of thing I think that you're looking for. And those guys are available. I will start with the top, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to make lists here. I mean, I, everybody has them because you know, who they are and, and, and who could fit. But I, I look to Dennis Allen, um, a guy who has been a coordinator, mm -hmm. uh, a very good one in this league and been a head coach in this league was, he was let go obviously by new Orleans this year. He was a part of the original defensive coordinator search way back in 2019, the one that ended with Lou Anarumo. And there are connections there. Look, all these New Orleans guys have come over here, right? There's vouching that's been done. There's knowledge of some of the players. I I, I feel like, and I don't know, that's, I just think that that one stands out to me the most of his background, uh, obviously a comfortability in who he is and who he has been. And he's been a really good coordinator when he's been a defensive coordinator. I of all the retreads or the you know the former head coaches from with defensive backgrounds, he stands out the most to me. There's others. I mean, you, Robert Sala obviously, um, mm -hmm. and and Matt Eberflus even, um, who you know let's if you take take game management off his hands, maybe it's not as big of a deal, right? <laughs> like it's okay. Yeah. Great coordinator uh, for yeah. the Colts on defensive side of the ball. So I, you know, that to me feels like the most obvious. I, I would say I would then pass my second would be that they go with a young and up and coming and, and I, I would boot that loose days. I, it just feels really hard to sell that at this point. Um, I, 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 it's not, it's certainly not off the table. I do not think that that decision has been made at all. And we've seen, if you've been around this organization over time at all, you know, there's been plenty of coaches, head assistant, you name it, coordinator, that have felt like they couldn't survive and then have done something over the last month or couple of weeks of the season. And it has saved their job. Uh, Lewis comma Marvin uh, has happened multiple times here over, over the years. And that's a, a bigger example and an older example. Uh, but I, you know, I don't think it's totally off the table that you could say, look, they, they these players w weren't good enough. Lou still knows how to coach. And I think you could make that argument. And so I don't think that's impossible. I certainly don't think that it's impossible, but I, I would boot that amongst these three. Yeah, I have the exact same order. And, you know, that with the Lou thing, we, we back a few weeks ago when we were talking about, oh, there's no good offenses left on the schedule. Well, the Cowboys have found something with Cooper Rush. Obviously, the Browns have found something with Jameis Winston. The, the Steelers just put up 400-some yards on the Bengals. Broncos are playing way better with Bo Nix. And so, yeah, it's all of a sudden there's a challenge here, and it, it it's not – you don't see that possibility of, well, maybe they turn it around and they, they string together some good defensive performances. That seems like a long shot. And then the, the, the reason I would go with the veteran, kind of the same as you over a young guy, you've got a lot of young players trying to learn on the fly. You can't have a coordinator trying to learn that job on the fly and teach young guys how to play in this league on the fly. So it, it makes total sense to me to go get a guy with skins on the wall that not, not necessarily had coaching experience, but a guy that's, it's been a defensive coordinator with success in this league. And, and I think it does help that, that even though Sala, Dennis Allen, and Iberflus all do have head coaching experience, none of them did particularly well. So that's, that doesn't put that little built-in threat where, you know, Zach's a little – seat's getting a little warm too. And sure. you, that's, that, that's, you get a little uneasy there if you hire a guy that's got head coaching experience. Like, oh, if this goes south, they just slide him in there. I don't think any of those three would be a threat to, to that kind of scenario and that's the other side of the story that i want to touch on here before we get into segments and that is the zach taylor side of this conversation um 
that is obviously very important to talk about is, is, you know, because that's what happens. If, if that is the way this goes, the seat is immediately smoking on Zach Taylor. Mm -hmm. It's like, Hey, you got a year, you know, you, you, you got the coordinator switch, whatever you got a year to, to put it together and, and, and get back, get things back to where they belong. I mean, that's, that's, Suggest any at that it goes everywhere in the league. Every time you see a coordinator go down mm. anywhere in this league, and that includes in the offseason, you know that the head coach's seat just went up about 30 degrees <laughs> because that's what happens. That's what it means. That 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 is how blame gets passed and it ends up on you. You can't you just can't keep firing coordinators. No, that's not gonna happen. Um, so what is the responsibility level? for Zach Taylor when it when it comes to this win the offense has been so good you know you have a top five offense in this league they're posting they have more games with 33 or more points than anybody (laughs) else they're just losing them you're right I mean we've seen you've seen the stats at this point we don't need to keep repeating them and so but he's the head coach and Mm -hmm. and he's responsible for this defense and he, he he's not just the guy calling the plays he's the head coach of this team that does all of it so there was a bunch of things in that realm and with the state of the defense that i I thought were important to touch on with zach taylor we did uh, i clipped some of those together from his monday press conference so here is some of zach taylor on this topic and we'll discuss it on the flip side when you went back and, and watched the game what part of the defensive performance bothered you most you know, we've got to tackle better. There's no question. We've got to be on the same page with all the details. I think it's as simple as that. Find ways to create turnovers, get stops. Guys are accountable for it. You guys feel, you know, like they get punched in the gut. We all feel that way. Um, as I said, we, the, the, all three phases, there's things that we can do better to help us win a game. It's not just on one unit. And when a season's gone the way this is, it's everybody's got to take accountability for that. And I feel that from this team. It's, it's, a, it's a team that's hurt. I mean, it's quite frankly, we all expected to win yesterday, expected to win a lot more this season. It hasn't gone our way. Um, we got to take accountability for it, pick ourselves up, and go find a way to have a better performance this weekend. How, how do you explain a team not being on the same page with yeah. all the details in week 13? I, I wish I could explain it. You know, it's something we work through. Um, I do feel good about the preparation, but that hasn't shown up on, on game day as much as it needs to. And we'll keep working through it. Um, we got guys that care. You know, that, that's that's obviously an important part of it is it means something to everybody out there. It's not guys that are um, putting in half effort and pointing fingers at each other. It, it's guys that are hurt and care and take a lot of pride in their performance and the unit's performance and the team's performance. And so, again, we, we just got to find a way to improve. What are your discussions with Lou after a game like this? Just finding solutions. And, again, here on December 2nd, whatever it is, um, it, there's no magic formula that's going to fix everything and change everything. So we got to get guys playing detailed, playing fast, be in a great position to make the tackles, get guys on the field to create stops. You were a lot about building the right culture over the last three years and making sure everybody had the right attitude. Mm-hmm. How much are you leaning on that now in, in more difficult Quite times? a bit. Quite a bit. Do you guys feel like you need to start rebuilding that again to get guys that are more guys that are about the right stuff and figure out more guys that are? About I, right I, I don't look around the locker room and think that we got guys that aren't in this thing together. You know, and so again, we just we got to play at a higher level. Um, I don't think we've got we've got the wrong people. We just got to get get guys to play at a higher level in all three phases. Coach, we got to coach at a higher level. You know, it's I'm not gonna sit here and put this on the players. <laughs> you know, as a head coach, you sit there and, and you're four and eight. You're a four and eight head coach, and, and that starts with you. And um, to get the most out of everybody, that's my job, and I don't take that lightly. Uh, there's a lot that comes with that. I, I love the responsibility. Um, but with you, there come moments like this where, where you got to put it on your shoulders and find ways to, to motivate everyone and get the most out of everyone. And um, there's a lot of work that goes into that. How much, along those lines, how much responsibility do you feel over the defense? You, you let Lou do his thing yeah. on that side. How much responsibility as the head coach do you feel over that defense? A lot, a lot. You can't shy away from that. And just because... Um, most of my knowledge is on offense, and that's how I came up. Is the head coach that changes, and and you answer to everything. And so, um, again, there's there's obviously there's challenges when you're calling plays and, and you're on the offensive side of the ball. But 
there's no excuse for it. You got, you got 24 hours in a day, and you got to make the most of it. And um, I do everything I can to, to spend time with Lou and and have knowledge of what's happening and what the issues are over there, and doing everything I can to help him. There's Zach Taylor. You know, you're a four and eight head coach. He says it himself. I mean, that's sort of the the overall theme of this. Is this? It does still fall on you. I mean, it is. It is still your deal. And this the defense. He's never going to be the guy who's going to be able to fix the defensive side of the ball. I don't think other than, you know, ha having a, a, an opinion, being able to help and, and have that conversation about what it is, but he's always going to be a coach. Who's going to be a more reliant on a strong defensive coordinator and let that guy do his thing. Let turn it over. It's that's your thing. Um, but you know, the responsibility still does fall on him to, make that work and understand that that's still under his purview. And I, you know, I, he, there's no pass for that necessarily. No. And, and I, I get what he was saying where it is really hard to, to do the end game stuff. Cause you, you can't go back to the bench and talk to guys. You, you're, you're calling plays when they come off the field, but the, the work leading up to get these guys prepared, that, that, that is something that, that he, he's not been hands off on that. And, and yeah, his, his background's in offense and and that's how he came up and but that's it's not in a vacuum you have to you have to understand defense and and how defenses work and how they want to attack you and yeah. all of that to 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 create an offensive game plan and so that that's where it's it's not coming up with new schemes and new ideas defensively that's where you leave that to the the guy that you put in charge of that defense but it is important for him to to be involved on that side of it. And I do think that has grown. I, I I think it over the, not just because of the struggles, but just naturally as you become a head coach and you get more comfortable and more set in your ways and what you're doing and on the offensive side, then, then you do have more time. You're more efficient with your time to, to go over there and, and work with Lou. And like they were saying, a lot of times it's, it's at the end of the day, they've done everything that they need to do on their side of the ball. And then they get together and that's, it shows that they are working at it. That's at a, at a point when a lot of people put the pencil down, you go home and, and and they're putting even more time in, in the evening, trying to get this thing figured out. So he knows, obviously it, it's what Lou said. It's what you sign up for when you become a coach. And he understands that he's got to get this right. Will they? I don't know. It, it, it doesn't seem like it's going to happen in these final five weeks. And um, it's going to be, one of the key decisions of, of his his coaching tenure here is who they bring in next. Yeah, or or does he decide to still believe in Lou? Right, that's the that's the that's the, yeah. that, this is this is a, a, certainly a crossroads for him. And then another part of that would be, and is there something where does he need to be give, giving more intention in game to the defense? Is that a if pitcher is under the assumption that Dan Pitcher is still here, uh, if he doesn't get a head coaching job or whatever. Um, do you turn over play calling to him to allow yourself to be more involved in the other parts of the game a little bit more on the defensive side of the ball or whatever? Is that something that's worth his time uh, if he reevaluates it that way with the comfort level that he would have with somebody like Pitch? Another interesting thing for them to process if they hit the offseason and, and, and figure out where they're going to go from here. So on that note, whoo. I think we've covered it. there's just there's just a lot there's just a yeah lot. there's just a lot going on to dissect right now it seasons go like this and there are a million different tangents off of them we will continue to get to as many of them uh as we can jay on that note do you have some stats for me um i do so i, I found this interesting where we, we've talked about it so much with with how much the bengals are scoring and how much they're giving up and their point differential is only minus five. And so I, you could see a world where if they win multiple games down the stretch and they win them by, by big margins, if the defense does come up and, and have a couple games where, where they could, they could finish with more points scored than allowed, but still have a losing record. So I was kind of curious, well, what's, what's the most that that's happened in, in Bengals history? Um, the 1983 team had a plus 44 differential and they were only seven and nine. That's the number seven point differential of all time for teams with a losing record. Mm. The 
the 1971 team, their point differential was only plus 19. They were four and 10. Wow. That is the that is the worst winning percentage in NFL history for a team that still had a positive point differential. <laughs> um, they lost their final three games by 26 points. It would have been they were plus 45 before they even wow. went into that that little tailspin. Um, so if you're talking NFL history, the the record for a team with a losing record, best point differential plus 71. The 1981 Falcons. Could the Bengals get there? Could they could they outscore their opponents by 76? <laughs> points down there no way I'm, the offense says they could the defense says sure. probably not but if you if you if you do hit a couple of these teams that they're playing better now but they're not traditionally good offenses and if, if the defense finds a way to put a couple of good games together the Bengals could get on that list it's so sad that where this is the conversation yeah. this is the, the where the stats have gone already it's only it's only December 3rd Jay it's only well, December I mean 3rd. you want draft stats yeah. Oh, trust me. <laughs> oh, I've seen mock draft Monday circling yeah. with everybody, everybody all, already making their picks. I'm like, I, I'm not ready to go to the mock no. draft simulator just yet. Um, I don't, I'm not, I'm, I'm just not, boy, we're, we're in early on a lot of stuff right now, but uh, yeah. I don't know that I'm going to the draft just yet. I'm watching. I'm interested in the prospects. I got thoughts, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going there yet. Um, a lot of decisions have to be made in what is going to be an insane off season for this franchise. And we'll be taking you through every little bit of it. Um, okay. Let's see what else we got. An another RPB. I, I have an, I have an RPB for you. Jay. Okay. I don't know if you saw this, there was a play. Um, I want to shout out Taylor Cornell, who um, also has a, a podcast and that you see, you might know him uh, on, he's always posting stuff like this. I've seen it on Twitter and other social outlets. It's a play from, uh, fourth quarter, it's 41 24, and Burrow kind of checks it down to Chase Brown, and the ball is well gone. It's a little easy dump pass, and you see TJ Watt take a crazy late hit in the back on him. And Burrow kind of gets up and looks back, like, uh, did no one see that? Like, whatever, <laughs> no flag. TJ kind of got a free licking way late. Mm -hmm. Cody Ford was right there. It happened right in front of his eyes and he does nothing. So my RPB for you, who had the worst reaction in this situation, <laughs> TJ Watt to do it, the ref to not throw the flag or Cody Ford to just leave it alone. So I, I I'm going to give, normally I would say Cody Ford. I'm going to give him a little bit of a pass here. I'm going to say the ref, John hockey Lee, who I wrote about, they, they were one of the flag happiest crews in the league coming in, top five. They threw 20 flags in that game. It's not yeah. like, okay, we're, this is going to be a let him play kind of game. They were calling everything. And then to let that go, it, it just doesn't make any sense. They probably threw, I'm sure there was a couple that were declined. 20, 20 penalties oh, were yeah. accepted. A bunch. So that that's just stunning that they, they don't do that, that they don't call that. The reason I give Cody Ford a pass on this is – it was 41 to 24. It's in the fourth quarter. Your margin of error for coming back and winning this game is so slim. They just got a first down into Pittsburgh territory. It was different. It was the first quarter. Would Cody have, have done something to TJ? Well, I don't know. But I, I think it was a there's a little bit of restraint that needed to be held there. You don't, yeah, you he could have confronted him without getting a penalty, but to, to go in there and, and blast him kind of like what we saw with Jacksonville and Houston, do something like that, get a penalty, knock yourself back on the other side of the, the 50 yard line. So that's why I'm giving him a little bit of a pass there. And I'm going to boot TJ Watt. I mean, that's what they do. You go back. I think it was the first play of the game. There was a, there was very early in the game. Uh, Bengals had the ball and there was a false start and play obviously dead. And a Landon Roberts still comes in and gives Joe Burrow a little, shoulder shiver in the back just to let him know he's there they do that any chance they can get around him they'll swat they'll just get hands on him just get hands on the quarterback let him know you're there you're going to be there all day this was tj watt with the opposite there he, he if he gets flagged there so be it you're up you're up 17 points you get a shot on the quarterback you make him think twice so i i'm gonna boot him as the the worst reaction 
Yeah, there was a play earlier in the game too that's gotten a lot of run of the it looked the like roll. almost kind of the gator roll of kind of yeah. twisting the ankles afterwards. It's again a more stuff that hey that that that's their mission right to to keep the quarterback thinking about him. I'll I'll, I'll give you some of that. I, I you know Cody Ford should know how to approach T.J. Watt there and not get a penalty. Mm. You, you can get up in his face and give him a little little half a shove, right? Like yeah. or 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 something. I mean, I, I just. Again, how is th- how this is just such a weird common theme that has gone on this year mm-hmm. of what feels like just not protecting. And maybe it's because he takes so many hits and they're just like, I don't know, it's just another hit. Just that another one. But I mean, you know, I just feel like we're talking about this at a crazy amount where you just see these types of things with no one ever coming to his defense even a little bit and so i i don't i don't know i'm putting that one on i'm cody i'm running with cody on that <laughs> one uh growler bet the growler bet that you guys came up with last week jay was what what was it exactly was it passing yards pittsburgh steelers net passing yards net passing yards uh i'm gonna guess that nobody even contemplated the idea of 410 being their answer even for a second even if there was a way to throw a joke in there around a 400 something number uh jay no winners correct no the highest one i saw was 278 my, my takeaway from this is this growler bet absolves the Bengals front office you guys <laughs> they didn't think these were bad players you guys didn't think these were bad players nobody thought it was going to be two, over 400 yards i'm included I picked 212. They almost doubled that. It was 410 wow. was the answer. Uh, Mark had 211. I had 212. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody saw this coming. And then the crazy thing was, and you've talked about it, you've written about it, these weren't Russell Wilson moon balls, nine balls down the mm. floor, big chunks at a time. It was a lot of underneath stuff, and the Bengals just failing to get guys on the ground. Yeah, just brutal for it. <laughs> I mean, for I love that the highest, the highest is 278. And it ends up at 410. I mean, the, the worst case scenario in anybody's mind they were willing to go with was 278. It goes to show is it, you where. Is this the first time we've never had a so close? I mean, I mean, not so close, not even in the so stratosphere, not even the same stratosphere. I mean, we're yeah. just just unbelievable. Uh, just goes to show you uh, how bad it was. Okay. Um, Arby's, before we get out of here, do you have any, uh, do you have any Arby's? Yeah. I, I mean, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but. Watching that game last night, the Broncos Browns game, and it's just like, oh my God, what are these teams going to do to the this Bengals defense? I mean, Jameis Winston, four hundred ninety-seven yards. Yeah, that that Broncos defense is legit. They, they are leading the league in fewest yards allowed per play. I, I don't know. I just, you know, I, I was watching the game because I had a chance to go sixteen and zero in my pick'em league, and so I was kind of wow. watching it through that Look lens. At you. I picked a Browns upset, so it didn't happen. Jameis. Humble brag. Couple couple pick sixes ruined my chances there. But I I just I kept watching that game thinking, man, what are these offenses gonna do? And and the Broncos weren't great offensively, but but they still they showed flashes and they had some chunk plays. And Cortland Sutton Cortland Sutton Sutton played really well in that game. Bo Nix continues to to really evolve and I just I I couldn't watch that game without thinking about these are the next two home games and they could look a lot like the last home game we just got. Yeah, well we've we know what those games look like. We're pretty used to covering them at this yeah. point. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, I want to first off thank you and Mark and everybody for helping cover as I kind of yeah. dipped out last week over Thanksgiving. It was an awesome holiday uh, and chance to get away with my family and go see all kinds of stuff and and get good family time in. It's much needed, and uh, you guys, it was awesome. Listen, listen to everything on the way back on the on the drive <laughs> back. Got me all caught up with everything that was going on. So I, I certainly appreciated everything. Uh, it was it was funny, literally. You guys talking about yeah, probably listening to this on your long drive home, and I'm like sitting there in the car driving. <laughs> like, yep, yep, not hard to predict. Absolutely nailed it. Um, so I certainly appreciate that. Very helpful, and I I come back refreshed and ready for more more of this Bengals action. Right. Uh, I gotta say, I I wanted to just point out the you know it's gone bad, and and you know it's gone to a truly dark place when it ends with like chad johnson crying 
It's we, we've got now Chad, Chad in tears on his on his podcast, and you had him making a bet with Ryan Clark. Ryan Clark saying you can't eat McDonald's for the rest of the year on the Steelers Bengals game. Chad is in tears and not eating McDonald's. This season has taken Bengals people to really, really tough, dark places. That's that is apparent. And uh, it's just I just was unbelievable. You see, it's like, man, it's gotten really low when they when they've <laughs> taken Chad to the point that he's crying and not eating McDonald's. So I just I, I wanted to make sure that that got its proper attention. Was he crying because he can't eat McDonald's or was he crying because the good question? Lost? I, you know, we don't know the root, right? Like we don't know the true root, uh, of, of the emotions, but, uh, this, this is, uh, even hit Chad hard that Mr. Mr. Positivity and confidence when it comes to pumping up the bangles. So, uh, ch- shout out to Chad. I did want to mention one other thing because on the theme of listening to shows that we're not on, I, I love the, the film breakdown you did with Charlie, the new thing this week. Oh. Thanks. And it, it was it, it was so funny because he was talking. To, I went back and watched all those plays too. For the, the, I counted up the missed tackles and wrote a story about that. And I missed the one, but he was talking about Miles Murphy dropping in coverage, turning his head like a cornerback, and then the four car <laughs> pile up. And I immediately stopped the pod, went and called up NFL Pro and watched that play. And so it was it was good. I mean, I, the whole thing was great. If you guys haven't seen it yet, check it out. Um, but yeah, a great addition to the Growler lineup. Yeah, excited about doing that for the rest of the year with Charlie, uh, who is awesome. Uh, you know, he he's he's great at so many things, but I, I always love talking ball with him, and he loves diving into the film and and breaking through it. So it seemed like a natural fit uh, for those day after games to talk over what he saw on there and 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 go through a little bit of the film. So yeah, uh, the rewatch reaction shows will be up the day after the game. Uh, on road games, it'll be a little harder, but I'll find ways to get to them and and. And Charlie, I know, will be ready with with all the breakdowns. So, yeah, keep checking that out. We'll have that for the rest of the season. So, anyway, thanks, everybody, uh, for listening to this. Uh, we will be uh, – we'll keep it rolling here the rest of the week. Plenty more to go as the Bengals prepare for the Monday Night Football game in Dallas against the Cowboys. So, thanks, everybody, for listening, and we will talk to you next time. Have a good one.